Open your Bible, please, to uh, Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. We'll begin at verse 11. <clears throat> My title today is Barn Finds, or Things That Are Found in Barns. Once in a while, I like to watch such a show on YouTube where an old barn door is opened and after many years, and inside there sits an old car. Many times an expensive or rare car and uh, maybe a Jaguar or a Cadillac or my all-time favorite, 53 Hudson Hornet, twin carburetor. Well, having been there for many years, the car is covered with dust and grit, the tires are flat, and the mice have nested in the engine compartment, they've chewed through some of the wires. But finally, it's towed out and taken to the shop, and the restoration process begins. I personally get a great deal of pleasure in seeing an object well-worn and ready for the trash, be it a car or a piece of furniture, brought back to its former beauty and usefulness. And what is true of inanimate objects is also true even more so of people. Who does not thrill to see someone hooked on alcohol or drugs restored to a life of freedom and usefulness? Who fails to experience great joy when a believer who, like Peter, has walked afar off for a long time, restored to fellowship with the Lord? Like some old car, people sometimes get to the point where restoration is necessary. And this is even true of Christians, born again, ready for heaven, but for various reasons, carelessness, sinful living, backsliding, whatever, find themselves in a condition where the glow has faded the excitement gone, and the ability to glorify God is just like that old car become hidden by the grime and dust of this world. And it's going to take some serious work to get them back to a usable condition. But there is a master craftsman who is eminently able to get the job done, of course, God himself. And as you know, he had to do it frequently with his own people, his ancient people, Israel. The Israelites, in spite of their position of privilege, were always a wayward lot, given to wandering and turning their backs on God. And as a result, many times the Lord had to be involved in the restoration process. And of course, the greatest of these episodes is yet to come, when their Messiah returns to set up his glorious kingdom, and the nation will be ultimately restored. One of the great passages concerning this restoration process of Israel is found in Jeremiah chapter 29. Now, in terms of background, a letter had been sent to the Jewish captives in Babylon who had been given false information concerning the length of their captivity, how long they were going to be kept there. That would be of a limited duration. It wouldn't be very long. 
Jeremiah, however, instructed them to settle down and wait for God's deliverance after a great while. Seventy years, as it turned out. After a great while. Now look at verses 11 through 14 of chapter 29, where Jeremiah said this, for I, know, uh, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. So here we have the master restorer with Israel as the object of his skill. And in this passage, we discover three elements, three elements in the process from which hopefully we will be able to draw parallels for our own lives in order to help us understand how we may deal with similar issues. In the first place then, notice in verse 11, God's plans, God's plans. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. You will recall that the chief reason that Israel was taken into bondage was because of uh, idolatry, the worship of idols of wood and of stone. But here, Jehovah is presenting himself as something entirely different. He alone, of all the so-called gods, has personality, intellect, emotions, and will. And here, his thoughts are focused upon his wayward people, much like the father of the prodigal son, you remember. Notice how the verse reveals the characteristics of his parental thought. In the first place, these thoughts are personal. I have plans for you. I have plans for you. The heavens may declare the glory and the, the eternal power of the Godhood, but only by revelation could Israel discover God's intentions for them and how very much like God. His sinning, disobedient people under his hand of discipline and yet still very much in his plans. And not only are God's thoughts toward them personal, they are also benevolent. Again in verse 11, plans for welfare and not calamity. Now, what's the inference here? God is saying, because you are under chastening, you will be assuming that I have your destruction in mind, that my chief aim is to harm you, but you are mistaken because even when I discipline you, I still love you. Are you experiencing, experiencing some chastening of the Lord today? I hope not. Are you experiencing some things in life that are unpleasant? Uh, illness, sickness, uh, situations that are unpleasant? Well, we must never let our thoughts drift into that area where Maybe God is not loving us as we feel he ought to. Maybe God in his displeasure is turning away from us just a little bit. No, like Israel, we are still loved of God. We're still his children. We're mistaken. God says, I'm still seeking the peace of Jerusalem, not her destruction. Then thirdly, God's thoughts toward his people are prospective, verse 11, to give you a future and a hope. In other words, the promise was 
that discipline was not to last forever. It never does. One day, they would be regathered. And the, ult- the ultimate fulfillment, as you may remember, is found in Zechariah chapters 12 and, and 14. And then great, God's great purpose will reach full fruition. You see, when God's people, when we step out of line, out of his will, he will apply chastening. He will correct. He will sometimes spank. He must sometimes inflict pain upon his children in order to get our attention and to draw us back to himself. However, and this is important, the discipline is always tailored to the problem. The discipline that I experience is always going to be different than the discipline you will experience because God always disciplines according to the nature of the situation. So as far as we and our experience is concerned, whenever we find ourselves in the crucible, be it for discipline, because of unconfessed sin, or simply because God is teaching us an important lesson, it is important to focus upon these ideas set forth in verse 11, that God still loves his own, be it Israel, the church, or us of the church. Still loves his own, and that his ultimate intention in all of it is for our good and his glory. Amen? Our good and his glory. Now, from God's plans in dealing with the restoration of his people, we come to the second element, which we will call God's anticipation. In other words, what he expects, what he expects. Verse 12, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Having revealed his intentions, God now expected that the people would gladly accept them and act accordingly. Notice the time word right at the beginning, then. Then you will call upon me. That is, when the period of discipline has come to an end. Then you will come, and then, then I will listen. So if God has me under chastening at this point, He's trying to lead me to the place where I confess if that is necessary, I change if that is necessary, and the the discipline is no longer necessary, then, then you will call upon me, says God, and then I will hear you, and so on. Notice the personal pronouns in these verses. They're very important. I never really noticed them before, but in in observing these verses this past week again, notice in in these verses the personal pronouns. Now look at them. Me, me, I, me, me, me. What? What is God doing? God does not so much desire his people to seek deliverance as much as he wants them to seek the deliverer. That's so important. You will call upon me, and I will come, and you'll come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. We're seeking Not deliverance, but we're seeking the deliverer. We're seeking to learn the lessons he's teaching us during this difficult time. The point is, God was going to address 
Israel concerning her future and her hope. But he could only, this could only be accomplished by the sorrows of discipline. They would allow themselves to come to the knowledge of sin, repent, change their minds, and turn back to him. That's the point of the then in verse 12 and of the seeking and finding in verse 13. God had tailored a specific corrective for their particular sins of coldness and idolatry. Seventy years of captivity. And when the time necessary for it to do his work had passed, he rightly expected a correct, a correct response. Calling upon him. Praying to him. Seeking him, to him. To which he appended the promise, finding him. Finding him. Sounds like a good formula for us too. Now from his plans and his anticipation, we arrive at God's promises. Verse 14. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. God, of course, is obligated to no one, but he has accommodated himself relative to man's faith response. And so the promises follow. First of all, to listen, to listen. At the appointed time when he knows the work is done, when the heart cries out and the refinement is complete, then he is promised to hear. Secondly, to answer. During the captivity, nothing could be done. That was not possible. And the heavens, no doubt, seemed as brass, with no answer ever coming from God for 70 whole years. But again, at the appointed time, he answered, and will answer yet again. Thirdly, then, to restore. The key to successful restoration of an old car or a piece of furniture or anything is to do as little as possible so as to retain as much of the original patina as possible. Because in this way, the beauty of the finish and the skill of the original craftsman is retained again to be enjoyed. However, sometimes the attempt to retain that original finish fails. Sometimes as God is correcting us, we resist the restoration process. We don't want to be restored. And so, the original finish fails. And like an old car, an old piece of furniture, complete removal becomes necessary, and a new finish has to be applied. What I think I'm seeing here is that God loves us in the process of chastening us, correcting us, allowing us to go through trials. All of that is backed up by his love and he wants to do as little of that as possible before he has to do a complete job. So we ought not to harden our hearts. We ought to respond quickly to what God is trying to teach us. Now when the complete finish has to be taken off and a new job has to be done, a new paint job, the object will never Look as it once did. The original work is gone forever. But nevertheless, in the hands of a skilled craftsman, a skilled restorer, 
It may look at least acceptable. This was Israel. God had desired to restore her earlier. He sent judges, he sent prophets, he preached to them year after year, decade after decade, and they would not. And before radical treatment was necessary, he tried to restore them. And so, captivity. In restoration, she was to be less than she had been. Fewer in number, the glory had departed, the temple a shadow of its former self, and yet God was still set on fulfilling his promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and will certainly do so when the kingdom arrives. Now let's engage in some personal application. I've already done some of that. What is the message to our lives? Well, let's say that I examine my own heart right now. That's always a good thing to do. I examine my own heart right now, and I discover that it is far from what it ought to be. Like an old car covered in grime, or like the prodigal son, I find myself in a far country, spiritually speaking. I've lost interest in spiritual things. I'm subsisting on the husks that the swine eat. Coming to this realization and believing that God is the master restorer and the only one who is able to bring back the original luster, I sense that the message is for me. So I confess my sins. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I enter into sweet fellowship again with my Lord. However, I may object, it will never be quite the same. Perhaps, but I can, it can still be glorious, that is, to God's glory. So if God is speaking to me and to you today in this way, do not wait until more radical work becomes necessary. Respond now and allow him to heal, to revive, and to restore. But perhaps today your case is different. You sense a need of God in your life, but you don't quite understand how all of this pertains to you. Well, perhaps the grime that you detect in your life has to do with what it says, for example, in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If such is the case, then you must give heed to some other scriptures. For example, Romans 5.8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And John 3.16, for God so loved the world, put your own name in there, for God so loved John Doe that he gave his only begotten son that John Doe, believing in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. The Lord Jesus took your sin, died on the cross, shed his precious blood, and died in our place. Will you believe and accept him now as your personal savior? And then finally, as I close, what of a church? What of a church? A church through no fault of its own requires God's restoration? Can it be restored? Absolutely. And I firmly believe that it is onward and upward for Wiley Bible Church from here on. So let's request that of the Lord, that we may seek him and find him during these critical days in the life of our church. Let's request it of him as we sing our hymn of response as David comes. <laughs>